Okay, folks, we'll kind of keep going. Uh, we've got Zach Wilson here um, to talk about evictions. Good morning. Uh, my name is Zachary Wilson. I have a uh, small uh, sole practitioner uh, practice. Uh, I broke off on my own about uh, six years ago. Before then, I was with the firm here um, since 1983. So, and uh, one of my first uh, jobs when I uh, was an associate with um, that firm was to evict someone. And I said, whoa, you mean from their home? Um, so uh, I went through the process, learned the, uh, learned the statute. No one really seemed to know much about it. So, and it ended up being one of those bad evictions where it had to go all the way through you know, a hearing, and then um, uh, they wouldn't leave the property, and we had to go get the sheriff, and then that was bad, and it just was this um, eviction from hell. And then suddenly you know, I was kind of the local expert on it because I <laughs> had to go through the whole thing. So um, if you can avoid evictions, uh, please do so. You know, the best way to do it is to get a good tenant that uh, pays their rent on time and keeps the place clean and everything's good. But um, despite your best efforts, sometimes that doesn't work. And uh, then when there's a violation of the, uh, of the lease then, and they refuse to fix it, then you have to go through with this process. And it's a very step-by-step uh, -step process. It, uh, it is critical that the initial notices that you give are proper because they form the foundation of uh, the eviction. If your initial notice is improper and you go through all the rest of it, it'll come back to that, that weak foundation and your eviction house will fall. So uh, I'm gonna go through the eviction procedures. Um, mm -hmm. If you have any questions, uh, let me know. And if after this uh, program you still have questions, feel free to call me. Um, I noticed there was this one that felt it was unfair because Kathleen pro uh, provides free legal services, well, I, you can get some questions answered over the phone. And if you want to call me and you have a question, I'll do that for free. So um, hopefully uh, I'll teach you enough that uh, that won't be necessary, but feel free if, to do so if you need to. Okay, um, generally the, uh, the problem starts with the failure of the tenant to pay rent. And um, before you can start an eviction, you must give the three-day demand for possession, a uh, three-day demand for rent or possession. Um, if after the service of that uh, notice um, is you've, you've given it, and uh, you must accept the full payment if it's tendered within the three-day period. If they tender a partial payment, and you accept a partial payment, then you have negated your demand because you've modified what was supposed to be a demand and you've made it a, a deal. So uh, if you want to accept partial payment and it's substantial, that would be within your you know, business judgment to say, well, I'd rather have you know, $600 than, than no dollars and I'll simply serve uh, another demand for the remaining 400 and they'll have to pay that remaining 400 within the three day period. Uh, tendered full payment after the three days has uh, expired, you don't have to accept it. Uh, generally, you, that would result in you know you proceeding with the eviction and possibly having a vacancy. So, as a business uh, owner, you probably say, "Okay, I'll let you off this time. I'll take your money, let you stay, but pay rent on time in the future because I'm not going to be doing this all the time." Um, so th that is the demand for rent or possession. Re uh, with a g regard to a notice to quit, this really doesn't come up that often because most people have leases in writing with a set period. But for um, people that you know, are more lackadaisical, I guess, and don't have a lease agreement, and it's just kind of a month-to-month -month tenancy, or uh, maybe it's a farm lease and you have a year-to-year -year sort of tenancy, just a handshake deal, if you want to terminate that tenancy, uh, uh, the termination notice, the number of days of the termination notice depends on the, um, the length of the contract. Now, um, leases for one year or longer must be in writing. So this one year in writing really doesn't, um, the 91 days, um, you should have had a lease agreement. But you know, if you don't, um, then uh, it would be a 91-day notice. But most uh, frequently, it is a uh, month-to-month -month, 
notice. So you would have to give the uh, seven day notice to quit. It used to be a 10 day, uh, but they shifted to a more uh, lunar cycle rather than a decimal calendar. The, it, it works out better when you're doing time periods, not to have it in periods of tens or fives. It's better to have sevens and 28s and 35s. So they changed it a few years ago, and it is now a seven day notice. And you would have to give that notice uh, prior to the um, termination of the tenancy then in effect. So if it's in February, you have a month to month tenancy and you've got, um, um, and you want to terminate it in, in February, you'd have to give seven days notice prior to the end of February. So that would be on the 20th. Generally, because this day of service does not count. So then it'd be 21 through the 28. Or for a leap year, it'd be the 22nd. So, uh, uh, and then here comes a substantial uh, violation. Now, uh, Kathleen said that no notice was required when it was something so dangerous that, um, uh, you know, it endangered property or somebody's life or, or another resident. You do still have to give the notice, but there is no right to cure. Unlike the demand for rent or possession or the demand for compliance or possession, which I will, I will cover in a bit, the substantial violation is saying this was so critically dangerous that you don't have the right to cure. You're getting out in three days. And uh, so, uh, and that has to be a pretty substantial violation. That's why they call it a substantial violation. Discharge of a firearm, uh, lighting a fire in the living room, uh, you know, burning down the Christmas tree, uh, uh, beating up your uh, roommate, something like that. Something calling, you know, causing substantial physical injury or property injury. I would say that that is totally wrong. Um, I mean, if you have a, uh, you know, a month to month tenancy, oral tenancy, and you just say, I don't like this guy anymore, give him the seven day notice. Maybe that's what he was talking about. Like no, that's not true. No, you must give, uh, the, the notice is required, both for a non-compliance of, you know, failure to shovel, you know, the snow, or uh, for the failure to pay rent. You must provide well, that. Well, what you can do is just say, I'm not going to renew your lease at the end of the lease term because I'm tired of you. You know, you're a bad tenant. But, you know, if you've contractually agreed that they can stay through June 30th, right. that's your obligation. Now, if they violate the lease, then they're entitled to the notice. There is no self-help eviction in Colorado. So you can't just put stuff out on the street or you will be liable for damages. No, uh, then your lease contract would control. This is generally for when you don't have that written lease contract. So if you have a lease contract that goes through June 30th, you can't just give them a seven day notice to, you know, to quit in May. Yeah. So yeah, you have to comply with the terms of the, the full term. Well, the party that's in residence has an affirmative defense that they, uh, you know, they are a victim of domestic violence and shouldn't be the victim of also an eviction. Um, but the, uh, uh, for the perpetrator, yes, I, I would give him the demand uh, or the uh, substantial violation notice. Okay. Oh, he could post it on the premises. Oh. So yeah, a method, a method of serving a demand is by posting on the premises. So that's the law. Well, uh, that's, that's a judgment call because the, the, they increase the burden <laughs> of, of, your burden of proof to prove abandonment several years ago. So if you're pretty certain that it's so, so emptied, that it's just like trash and stuff laying around, but if he's left his important papers and some jewelry and, and you know, maybe some nice furniture and stuff, then you probably have to go through with the eviction. And uh, by doing that, you serve the notice on the premises both the demand and then when no one's there and you come back with your summons and complaint and the notice, the demand is still on the door, well, they haven't come by for that long and then you proceed with, through with the eviction, it seems silly, but you end up actually do, you put the stuff out on the street. But because your city has ordinances with regard to that, you leave it there, the sheriff leaves and then the police will be on you for the nuisance, so then you pick it up again but the sheriff won't let you haul it directly to the dumpster or to the dump. The sheriff says, put it out on the street. And then when it's been there for whatever, well, when the sheriff leaves, basically. Well, do you think it sounds legal that, you know, 
what if you what if you can't approve the abandonment? What if they say, you know, my mom was st suddenly struck ill and I, I had to leave school and I had to go back and I didn't have time to contact you and then I lost your contact information and I was a total wreck and then I came after, you know, three weeks and you've taken all my stuff? That probably wouldn't sound very good in court. Well, just because you buy a form doesn't mean some court here is going to want to enforce it. And that's what I think what Kathleen was talking about. She says, why have these onerous provisions that the courts won't enforce? And you, know, you do want that holdover provision in your lease, the one where it says, okay, we've had a year lease, yeah, but now that the term expires, it will go to a month to month. You do want that because under the old uh, Colorado law, the, it renews for another year. So if they hold over for a day, they say, sorry, you don't have a holdover provision in your lease, so it will roll over for another year. So make sure you have the holdover provision. <laughs> Relates to liability for uh, radon exposure because of the circumstances in Colorado. Uh, I would say that the fact that you installed the, uh, the mitigation system would help in your case a lot and uh, you're, you keep that report that you received after that mitigation was done, and if it shows that it was within the proper levels, and then when they make the allegation that you know, uh, they were exposed to radon, then have the t system tested again. If it's still in compliance, then you're pretty much clear. If you're out of compliance and, and radon is too high, well, then maybe you do have a liability exposure. Yeah, and then keep all those reports, and then you could show that the system was still working. All right, uh, demand for compliance or possession. Uh, this is for the wild parties or the failure to uh, uh, shovel the, uh, the walks. Um, again, it's a three-day notice. Um, they, after they initially ch um, put this law into effect, they did uh, realize that there was a problem that if you gave, if there's a wild party on a Friday night and you gave the three-day notice to comply, and then they all settle down for the, the week, then they have a wild party the next week, and you gave a three-day notice to comply, and then they were real good for Sunday through Wednesday, and then they partied again, it was a problem. So if they have the same repeat occurrence within a year, then it's just, you're out of here, okay? You do not have to give repeated demands for compliance or possession. And then the demand for possession, if someone is just in your house and you've allowed them to move in, and they're just staying, and uh, you say, I can't get rid of this person, that would be a simple demand for possession. Just, you're out in three days. You don't have a lease, I never agreed to anything, we don't have any terms, uh, you're just here, you're squatting in my property, get out. But they are still entitled to the three-day notice. Well, uh, uh, the lease uh, terminates on its own terms, so if, yeah, if they didn't move out on June 30th and you say, hey, I got a problem here, then you could give a demand for possession saying, I don't want you to pay rent. Yeah, I mean, if you say, you've got to give notice to me if, if you want to stay. Otherwise, um, your holdover tenancy is going to be month to month. You would uh, say, okay, yeah, I, I let this slide by, so they stayed now July 1. Okay, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, it's going to take you three weeks to evict them anyway. So then you, you give the, you know, the three-day to them and then start the eviction. No, you've got to follow the procedure you know, regarding texting or otherwise delivery of the notice. The notice must be delivered in person to a person uh, of, the, well, first of all, the, the tenant or a member of the tenant's family over the age of 15 or by posting on the premises. Yeah, you can develop a course of dealing where you, you handle your correspondence via texts. Okay. That's okay. It's just not it's just doesn't work for the notices. No, certified mail doesn't do any good for you. And for the, or you may be talking about uh, sending letters regarding the security deposit retention letter. The statute provides for regular mail. It's just by mail. And re registered and certified mail are more restrictive than general mail. They can be refused. So always send the security deposit retention letter by regular mail. If you want some proof that it was delivered or more proof, you can send it by certified, but that's not within the compliance of the statute. So always by regular mail. But with regard to notices, mail has no impact. The security deposit uh, statute requires that you uh, send a retention letter showing the reasons why you retained any portion of the security deposit within 30 days, or if your lease has it, up to 60 days. 
So um, when you've determined what your, the amount that you're going to withhold, then you would send that retention letter and, and refunding anything that you're not withholding within the 30 days to by regular mail, not by certified mail, okay? So the actual check goes in the registered, or actual check goes in the regular mail, but if you want to send another copy and a copy of the check, uh, you can send that by certified so you have a, a green slip if you want it. So the, 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 real, the real check and the real retention letter goes by regular mail, all right? All right, uh, requirements for the services of the notices. It's uh, by delivering a copy to the tenant, by leaving a copy with the uh, member of the family over the age of 15, uh, and if no one is there, uh, then by posting. And I put it in uh, highlights there that you must make an effort to personally serve the notice. Um, so you can't just sneak up in the middle of the night and post it on the door you know, and scurry away. You've actually got a pond on the door. So. Uh, and then the computation of time, this uh, changed recently, um, but in serving a three-day notice, the day of service does not count, and then uh, thereafter, every day does count, uh, and I've given some uh, examples. So if you serve it on a Friday, Friday doesn't count, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. If Monday is a holiday, it goes over to Tuesday. Then, if there hasn't been any compliance within the uh, the three-day period, uh, then you commence the uh, eviction. Again, it's a very uh, technical action. It may be brought in the district. I'm on the top of the third page now. On the top, uh, in the district court or the county court, uh, and uh, you probably don't want to wait until you have accrued damages of over $15,000, which pushes you into the district court. Start the eviction sooner. Don't let the, the monies build up over time. So. Uh, you'll mostly be in the county court. The county court is better at handling evictions because they do it a lot more than the district court does. So the district, the county court clerks know evictions and, and the process. So uh, the necessary allegations of the complaint, you must describe your, the property and that you are the owner of the property, the grounds for recovery, failure to comply or failure to pay rent, uh, the name of uh, the person that's in possession of the property, all the names, if you know the names, if you have a uh, lease with one tenant, but you know the name of the person that lives with that tenant, then name her then too. And then I usually put in, and all other unknown occupants of the premises, because you don't know who the guy in the basement is. But you want to make sure that you pick up everybody that you want evicted from that property. So tenant one, tenant two, and all other unknown persons all of their occupants, okay? Um, uh, the complaint may also say, I, and, I, and I'm owed money, I want, I want not only to recover possession of the property, but I want money that is owed to me. So the court will generally divide that case into two, two separate pieces. Like today, I just had a uh, hearing on possession only. That's all the court set it in for, is set in for not more than an hour, and, um, and it's just the issue of possession. And the tenant wanted to bring up all these other issues. You know, well, I did this, and I painted that, and I raked up that, and that wasn't an issue at all. It was all relating to the payment of rent. So the courts will limit that and just stick to the, sim the simple issue of, do you have a lease agreement? Was rent required to be paid? Was it paid? Was a demand given? And was the rent then paid within three days? That's, those are the five things I have to show. All of their occupants? Yes. And you, you don't name children as parties to the action. So it'd be the two parents and all of their occupants. Um, okay, uh, so um, I've gone over the two-pronged action. And then the summons, it is a, a special summons form. It, de uh, depend it de demands that the tenant appear in court not less than seven or more than 14 days from the date of, uh, uh, from the, uh, date of issuance. And um, I usually attach the lease and I attach the answer form to the complaint. So my little package is a summons saying, hey, you've got to come to court, a complaint, this is my beef against you and this is what I want the court to resolve, a copy of the lease so the court's informed and the tenant, they lose their leases all the time. So I provide a copy of the lease and uh, the answer form. 
So all you have to do is fill in the answer form, go to the courthouse, and pay the filing fee. Uh, then the service techni uh, technicalities, unlike the demand which you can serve as landlords, the initial demand, uh, the summons and complaint must be uh, served by another party. And if you want to use the, the sheriff, the sheriff uh, knows what to do there. Or if you know a private process server, or if you um, are confident that you have a responsible enough friend that would be willing to um, you know, follow the technicalities and appear in court if need be, then you can have that disinterested third party serve the, uh, the complaint. And I've set forth the requirements there. So if you do want your friend, you want to review that paragraph and say, here's what you need to do. And at the, okay, at the appearance date, uh, which is usually uh, early in the morning um, on pretty much any day of the week, um, uh, you can appear in court and if the tenant shows up, you can always try to work out a deal. They have little stipulation forms saying, okay, you showed up, you showed responsibility here, I will, we can work this out, you can make payment plans and you can stay in the property. Or you can work out any other stipulation, you get it signed right there and, um, and then um, the court will accept that and the court will approve whatever deal you worked out. Um, if that didn't, if they came back with this nasty answer and said, you know, my landlady's a real meanie and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going through some difficulties, that's not really a legal defense. The court may consider it, but if they say, um, I paid that and I put it in an envelope and stuck it in her door, well, then that, there's an issue of whether rent was received. The court will say that's not a reasonable way to deliver the rent, but uh, the court will then set that for a hearing. If the tenant does not show up, then you request the court to enter a default. And then uh, a default judgment for possession only will enter and the writ of restitution will issue 40, 48 hours thereafter. Okay, you know, a summary of the uh, question was, what if you're living in a property where the landlord does not provide adequate maintenance or allows a, a hazardous uh, condition to continue and when uh, a tenant makes a complaint, they're basically bullied and harassed and, and, and uh, threatened. Um, I would probably use the uh, warranty of habitability statute on that. Um, you know, if you have some uh, physical inability or you live on the 18th floor and the elevator doesn't work, you know, I think that would be grounds. If it's a two-story building and you're of, you know, uh, good health and, and good physical condition, you probably, probably wouldn't get away with that. Um, but, you know, if you're dependent on an elevator and the elevator isn't working, working that property isn't habitable for you. Um, as for the asbestos, uh, that is definitely a, a warranty of habitability issue. So then, I've, I've discussed later, it's not really, it doesn't go into uh, uh, evictions, but just as a courtesy, I provided some information about the warranty of habitability, and it provides for uh, notice and notice to the landlord, and if they fail to take corrective action within the five days, then you move out, and, and they are required to return your security deposit. So that's a pretty strong statute, uh, and uh, it took a long time to pass in Colorado, and there's, there's a lot of resistance to it, but just the trend across the country was to provide for, you know, a safe habitation. Right, well, then uh, she's saying, you know, I've tried going to state agencies, I've tried going to local agencies, they don't do anything for me, and it just results in more harassment. I would say, yeah, the onus is on, on you to probably, you know, uh, find yourself a landing spot, you know, secure alternate uh, 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 housing, and then pull the five-day five, five day trigger notice saying, I'm, I'm out of here. Because if they are doing it like that for you for so long, highly unlikely that they're going to tackle the asbestos and the elevator with, after that five-day notice. So just make sure you have a place to go. The, it, it's the habitability statute in Colorado. And it's the implied warranty of habitability that even if it's not in your lease agreement, it's implied in every lease contract. That if you're provi providing livable space, you must also provide a, a habitable space. Well, if, I mean, you take in those th factors into account when you buy an older house. You say, I know that I'm that there may be lead-based paint in this, and, and there is a lead-based paint disclosure. I know that uh, you know uh, it's probably got uh, asbestos too. 
asbestos is all right as long as it's not disturbed. But if you're starting to rip out walls and stuff, then yeah, then it, you will disturb it and you will have to do a full remediation. Otherwise, the premises will be deemed uninhabitable. All right, uh, well, uh, if the tenant does show up at the appearance date and files an answer and says, I don't owe this because I put the money in, uh, in an envelope uh, in her door, then uh, the court will set it for a hearing on possession. Again, that's gonna be a very limited hearing. I've given you the, uh, the five prima facie points that you have to show, and you just make your claim saying, tenant owes me $1,000, it was due on the first, I didn't get it, I waited through the grace period, he didn't pay then, so now he owes me the late fee, so I gave him a demand for $1,050, and he failed to pay within the three days. Boom, he's forfeited the lease. So, um, fairly, uh, fairly easy to do. Um, attorney's fees uh, can be granted if you have an attorney's fees provision in your lease. So all of your leases should have an attorney's fees provision that in the event of the tenant's default and you have to proceed to court, that you can recover your attorney's fees and court costs. Any questions there? Uh, and it's best to have an attorney's fees provision that doesn't say uh, the tenant will pay this and the tenant will pay that. Say the prevailing party. And, and that uh, is a, a balanced uh, attorney's fees um, provision because many courts will not, will not uh, enforce a one-sided onerous uh, attorney's fees provision. If it's balanced, then the court will enforce it. So it goes to the prevailing party. And sometimes the court does not uh, award something. Maybe you've brought an action for non-payment of rent and an action for non-compliance. Uh, you, you do prove your case for the non-payment of rent and, and evict the, the person, but you don't prove the non-compliance. The court will sometimes just say, well, you didn't prove this, and the tenant won on that issue, but you won on the rent issue. I'm going to find no prevailing party and not award attorney's fees. So yes, well, that, that's not a provision in the lease. That's a provision in the Colorado Security Deposit Statute. So if you have wrongfully withheld a portion of the deposit, and they hire an attorney, and they bring in legal action against you saying they, you know, all these were no normal wear and tear charges, and you know, uh, she wrongfully withheld my money, and it's your burden of proof when you go in on those hearings. No court, you know, I, I would had a good reason to withhold this money. So with your burden of proof, and if you don't satisfy that burden, and that attorney's sitting in, in the tenant's, uh, at the tenant's counsel table, then yeah, you can be, uh, nicked for attorney's fees and court costs too. Well, well, the penalty, it, the, the, this is an issue with regard to uh, wrongful withholding and the protections maybe now that are being put in place for tenants. Uh, the Colorado Security Deposit Act is uh, a protection for tenants. It provides that, uh, first of all, the money is always their money. You are just holding their money and it pres is presumed to be their money and uh, then you also have the burden of proof at the, at the trial. And then if you fail in your burden of proof, you are penalized three times the amount that you wrongfully withheld. So that's the penalty. A great check-in sheet and a great check-out sheet is a great um, a piece, uh, two pieces of evidence for the trial court. If, if it's not on the check-in sheet and it's on the check-out sheet, then the tenant's gonna be, be presumed to have done those damages. If it shows up on the check-in sheet and you're suing for repairing it, then that's bad evidence against you. So um, it's, a, it's a good way to prevent lawsuits or to uh, promote resolution with the two good check sheets. Uh, if you go through the rest of this and uh, have any questions, feel free to give me a call. All my information is on the front. Thank you.